right. Sorry to interrupt, Emily. No worries at all. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for dropping in. This is great. I'm so happy that we're at this point where we're kind of kicking off conversations about the piece and building up the conversation to lead up to the big concerts in March. Um, it's been about a year and a half of writing, mm. and uh, the piece just got finished in this last week, I'm so happy to say. Uh, and it all started with, you know, a general conversation that, um, you know, Laura asking if you were to write a piece for five by five, what might you think of doing? And I thought about, uh, I mean, I've, I've loved and played folk and traditional music since I was in high school. And my background as an ethnomusicologist was spending a lot of time in Latin America studying old musics and uh, people from the present day that, that play these traditions that go back so far. Um, I'm going to put my messages, put myself in focus mode so I don't hear any pings. But um, so mm -hmm. I started thinking about the, the singers and the poets and the musicians that I had spent a lot of time with in Chile who improvise poetry. And it's a form of poetry that well, number one goes back centuries, and then number two is also connected to um, 18th and 19th century uh, what are called broadside ballads, which are ballads that were printed on sheets of paper, like about this big, and they would, they would be hung up on ropes and sold in the city streets, or people would take them town to town, printed in the city, they'd spread all over the countryside telling the latest news, um, or printing really old ballads alongside the latest scandal or murder or battle story and uh, I thought uh, that there's a broadside ballad tradition in the United States too and I I was excited at the idea of digging into that and understanding this thing in the US that I knew about in um, Latin America and I just started digging I and I didn't know what way it was gonna go but I spent a lot of time um, at the New York State Library looking through their broadside ballad co collection reading books written in the 1920s about, you know, how broadside ballads work in their history. And here and there, I, I don't know, just the, the stories and the reading expanded and expanded. And soon I was reading about witches in me medieval Europe and um, who were, you know, uh, there were stories about them in broadside ballads from like the 1600s and then thinking, can I find any witch ballads in the US? I couldn't find that many or all, really any. But um, I was looking for stories of women, and so that led me down a path of also researching ghost stories. And I found um, two really compelling stories about women in the Hudson Valley. Um, but interestingly enough, you learn about these women through like the holes that their lives leave in the historical record. You, you can't find out a lot about some of them, but some scholars have done amazing research to kind of fill in as many gaps as possible in their lives. Um, and also just reflect on the fact that isn't it interesting that these women live on as ghosts in local legends because their lives and deaths say a lot about the times and how women lived, um, were limited. Um, yet the story lives on because those issues are continue to be important. Right. So people continued over the years telling these ghost legends um, and being, you know, haunted by the specters of these women who we didn't know that much about, but we knew kind of the circumstances uh, that they lived under. And so people retold and retold this. So this is me taking those stories and, and retelling them yet again to to really search out all those resonances uh, between um, what mattered in their lives and what still matters in our lives. Um, I'll be a little more explicit about that in a moment. Um, at the risk of wandering too much, I'll stop for a moment to see if, Laura, you want to guide the conversation one way or another. But I'd, I'll also jump into at one point, you know, who these women were specifically, when they lived, and uh, what their story is. Yeah. No. Well, we definitely want to hear about their particular stories. And I, I had a memory, Emily, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think when we first started talking about this, 
it was when reproductive rights were seeming to be newly or re not newly, but again, under attack at the moment when we met and we're talking and we were thinking about wanting to keep wanting to explore that in some way that maybe could bring stories back. And as you were saying, some stories that could resonate today from voices from the past. And I think that we're going, we're in that moment yet again. And so it's, I think yeah. it's there, it's a timely, there's some timely things. So maybe if you, if that's a springboard to go into where you wanted maybe to head. Sure. Um, it's something that's a lot on the front of my mind, both in research I've done and in music and songs I write. This idea of, you know, the limits and the borders and the frames that are built around, you know, people who identify as women and move through the world. You know, as I watch performances from, you know, all parts of Latin America where I've worked to in the States, watching women on stage, watching how they're presented, watching how they present themselves and um, just noting observing you know how people use language to kind of rein in uh almost you know sometimes female power um and then when you get into what's happening now when you think about um how institutional power is not just figuratively kind of trying to put limits on women's power decision autonomy um but we have you know institutional control over women's bodies in so many parts of this country. And so that's been present in my mind, it, it both dating back to, you know, years of research past, but also just much more recently. Um, and at the front of what I've been exploring in these piano songs, in a contemporary way, and then now in these um, ballads that tell these stories of um, two women. One is Annaliza Smith, um, who lived in the early 19th century in uh, the Hudson Valley in what is now called Socrates, New York. And then another woman, Anna Dorothea Swartz, who lived in, um, uh, around Catskill and was, we don't know whether she was an indentured servant or if she was enslaved, but the historical record, the only one we have of her says she was in service to the Salisbury family around Catskill on one of the son's estates. Um, so these, two stories attracted me because again both of these women lived on as ghosts and one of them I'll start with um Ann Eliza she was married to a folk balladeer you know so that's how I got to her was trying to find broadside ballad writers and there was this gentleman who became known as the bard of Saugerties who in his later years had a big carriage covered with bells grew out a long grizzly beard and he would write in verse the latest news, um, print it up at printers either in New York, sometimes in smaller towns if there was a printing press, and he would print them out, there'd be some kind of print on it, and he would travel town to town in his carriage, followed by yapping dogs, selling his ballads. But before he was the bard, he was Henry Bacchus, and he lived um, in Saugerties, uh, which was called Ulster at the time, and he was married to Anna Eliza. He was a school teacher. He was known as an energetic musician, creative guy, really um, good at improvising poetry. And um, after that, things get fuzzy. We have lots of cool anecdotes about him, but about Ann Eliza, we don't know too, too much. We know who her parents were. She came from a Dutch family. Um, and there was a folklorist who connect who collected some local stories about her and and the ghost story that lived on about her and her life was that she became ill um after a few years of marriage and shut herself up in the house pretty much didn't visit with anyone mm. and would you would see this fail, pale uh, pale face sitting at a window you know kind of watching life go by and that that Henry wore himself out taking care of her um, and that after her death he you know something kind of snapped in him he became a little you know um, looser you know uh, mentally and took to the roads you know and lived this life of the folk poet you know itinerant 
um, without a place, severed a lot of family ties. So, so that's the story. And that as he traveled the roads, her and she was gone, her, her face, her ghost was still present at the window watching and waiting for him. Um, so I just, as I uh, looked and read, um, I found one census document that said she didn't actually die when the story says she died. There's a record of her still living in New York with the entire family and that they had moved from Saugerties to New York City and he had continued to work as a school teacher. So I just started saying, what if we just fill in the gaps? And I was inspired in this by a, um, a, a sociologist, Avery Gordon, who, who does exactly this. She tells, she looks into the stories of ghosts and and encourages people to to reimagine all those spaces with what social and historical knowledge we have. You know, okay, so what would her life have possibly been like? Is this the story? Let's invert it. Let's play with it. Because um, I wanted to see her come out of the shadows of being kind of a passive face at the window. So I make her a bit of a protagonist. And the framing idea of this opening piece is that, you know, she was made a ghost before she actually died. People told stories of her at the window when she was actually a living, breathing, thriving person in New York City. So we hear a little bit of, the, of that story and we have the flavor of, you know, Henry's broadside ballads. Um, and and that's the first one. Uh, are you guys, should I launch into the second one? Do you guys have any yes. questions? Well, I'm, I'm looking at the lyrics and you ask, yeah. why did I become a ghost so long before I died? Yeah. 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 Oh, please it, tell. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, and I mean, it's just interesting the language we use, you know, in the piano songs, I, I think a lot and write a lot about, you know, softness and how we perceive people's voices even, you know, and how we're socialized to perceive lowness with authority and power and highness with things that are ephemeral and light and passing and of less substance incorporeal you know so it's just I so that's what this whole piece is kind of about of thinking about things and people higher voices lighter ways of speaking softer ways of moving through the world and um and kind of imbuing that softness and lightness with the idea of power you know and agency does that make sense and, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, also, yeah. you know, who who is telling the story, you know, where mm -hmm. we don't know, right? So the yeah. stories that have been told or whatever has been documented. We just yeah. have to yeah, guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please go on to the next one, which is heartbreaking. And yeah, yeah. Anna Dorothea Swartz is mentioned once in the historical record. Her name appears in a court document from Albany, New York. Uh, where there was a case, uh, the trial of William Salisbury, who was part of a wealthy landowning family. Their patent stretched back to, you know, the earliest days of settlement and displacement of indigenous populations in the Hudson Valley. So they had lots of land. Um, and she was, again, in service on William Salisbury Estates, the son or grandson of the original patent owners. And um, he was tried and found guilty of her murder um, it was in the springtime of the mid um, 1700s. I have the years not at the front of my mind right now, but again, about the mid 1700s, pre Revolutionary War. Uh, and this is a time where people, there's a lot of agricultural activity, people are moving around, the roads are full, there's boats on the water. There are different celebrations around this time, one of which is. Um, was uh, Pinkster, which was really, really important to enslaved and free black populations of the Hudson Valley, which was were significant in numbers. We don't really think about that time, but um, this part of the country in percentage was not that far behind, for example, Georgia in terms of uh, the percentage of in enslaved black communities, a uh, number of people that were here. So it was a time where there were a lot of festivities, a lot of music. Um, you heard the banjo in these parts more than I think we realize and think about you know nowadays we associate it with the south but it was very much present in Albany in New York City um, and possibly in other parts of the Hudson Valley so um, we don't know like different stories uh, 
that were gathered from local populations over the years say that Anna Dorothea was enslaved. Some say that she was um, from a part of Germany and she had come as and indentured herself, you know. Uh, a lot of people at that time would, in order to get passage to America, say, I will give 12 years of my life in exchange for the, the cost of travel, and I will work, you know, and essentially my, my life and my labor belongs to someone else for this period of time. So she was in one of these situations. Um, and she, as, as, again, different local retellings have it, she wanted to travel around this time of lots of movement, different celebrations going on. Some say she wanted to reunite temporarily with family that lived in another community that she hadn't seen in forever, or that simply there were some folks from Germany that were going to be coming through uh, from her same region and she wanted to connect, but she, she wanted to move her body, you know, away from the estate on her own <laughs> accord, and, um, and she did. And she may or may not, probably not, uh, she's not given a pass, you know, that uh, the landowner or or if it was um, this the case of an enslaved person that the, the master would have to give this person to travel. So she didn't have permission to travel, but she chose to. And um, he pursued her and found her. And um, when he did, he tied her with a rope to his horse. And um, some say he struck the horse himself. Some say it was an accident. But the result was that she was dragged to her death um, because of being tied up. And so there are very, very vivid tales, especially that were told and spread the following century about, about her ghost at Spook's Rock and what she looked like. And she also was all in white. Some people said she had candles for fingers, um, that she was a skeleton in a beautiful dress but all kinds of really vivid reimaginings that retold her story. Um, so I take fragments of the court case and kind of read those out, you know, as singing them, right? But then in kind of another voice, um, you hear her trying to tell her own story, right? About what she felt and what she wanted and needed. And again, she wanted to move her body freely, but her body was not under her control, you know? Uh, based on the family structure that she lived in um, with the Salisbury family, based on the institutional and social structures that surrounded that. Um, in uh, this beautiful book by Judith Richardson that really examines Anna Dorothea's story in particular, I get most of the information from this book. Um, you know, she calls this, this was perceived as a violation of the public order, you know, for an indentured person or an enslaved person to travel of their own accord or violate any kind of, um, or not be given permission, you know, to move. Um, and it was really important at this particular time in the 18th century because there was lots of discontent, I mean, among both enslaved populations and um, indentured populations, and a lot of push against that social structure, that order. And so there was a lot of fear among landowning, cla landowning classes, too, of loss of property and wealth and other things. So again, another reason why William Salisbury might have felt that he had to pursue her and that it, the story had to end with violence, right? Um, so her story is, is, is brutal. Um, and sometimes, so you see that brutality in the music. You'll hear it. You'll feel it. It's 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 it gets extremely intense. Um, but I also want people to hear just um, and imagine because we're imagining. We don't know who she was, but imagine her as this complete person with a big and beautiful story, who wanted to be with family. You know who, um, so that she's not just the the horror of her murder, which is the only document we have about her. But you know, just try to imagine that whole that whole time, that whole scene, and that despite being socialized to perceive oneself as one class or another, you know, um, with whatever legal <laughs> limits uh, that placed on one's body, that that everyone in those situations were still full and feeling and needing and denied that autonomy. So that's the last movement. Can you talk about wild horses where you have them together? Mm -hmm. So these two 
big movements are linked by a, a popular dance tune, which you know had dates or it's connected to different Irish and uh, British Isles melodies, but um, took on the name uh, Wild Horses at Stony Point in the United States. And it refers to a Revolutionary War battle that's, again, along the Hudson Valley. All these things are connected to the Hudson Valley. And I just, I knew I wanted to set a tune. And I set that one partly because of its location. A lot because of, you know, the location. I knew that it was a tune that circulated, you know, and that Henry Bacchus and, um, um, and Anne Eliza most likely would have heard or danced to or hummed, you know. So that idea of thinking that it was something that would have been circulating in their environment was attractive to, to kind of link these stories. Um, and again, that idea of the wild horses, I, I think about, about the horse that Anna Dorotheo was tied to. I think about the horses driving Henry's wagon up and down the Hudson. Um, and I think too about some other elements of Anna Liza's story. Um, as I reimagined her possible story, there are things we know about Henry. We knew he was a heavy drinker. We knew he suffered from different uh, mental illnesses. We knew he was in an asylum for a period. And I, I imagined um, her taking care of him. I imagined a moments of crisis. I imagined her being the one with her oldest son to take him all the way from Saugerties to Hudson, where he you know, was taken to recover and work with a particular doctor to come back to teaching. So I hear those horses too, you know, traveling in the middle of the night, you know, to try to protect him, keep him safe. So all of that energy unfolds in this tune that is quite bright, but then again, mixed in with some dark turns in the way it's set. Um, so it's, it's, it's an intense piece, right? <laughs> it's, it's all of the pieces I come at them in the same way I come at writing a song, which is in a little bit of an elliptical way. They're, as much as broadside ballads will tell you the story step by step, I do that sometimes in little fragments. I'll give you a clear verse, I'll give you a tight rhyme, I'll, I'll set the story, but then, then we'll zoom back out and we'll be in the feeling and we'll hear voices echoing and we'll hear you know, the, the heart of the story, the, the feeling of the story, the the power of Anna Dorothea's beauty, uh, you know, uh, side by side with, you know, the bits of kind of concrete language. So we zoom in and out of, you know, concrete and then like more uh, elusive language wrapped in just gorgeous textures that you all are going to provide. I would love to hear um some about maybe rounder songs in a little bit mm -hmm. for people that that don't know that this other song cycle that you wrote but would you maybe share some music with us sure i was gonna play tonight i was just gonna play the the wild horses at stony point so yeah. you can hear the tune on banjo um and then enjoy where it goes when we play it all together in the spring This is a beautiful, beautiful tune. It's really bright, it's really jolly, but then um, you can do some poignant things with it in the third section that takes kind of a minor turn. Thank you. 
horses at Stony Point. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and Rounder Songs was like a, a jumping off point for all of this. Um, that was written a while back, released in uh, 2017, I think. Um, time, time has become so strange since the pandemic, but <laughs> that was a first attempt uh, to kind of see what I could do with this banjo in a chamber music setting, and my husband Patrick and I wrote that together uh, and set beautiful songs from Appalachia about rounders or travelers, you know, people, Rail Rounder was someone who would go community to community looking for work. Sometimes they had a bad reputation for causing trouble. Um, and rounder songs themselves too were um, a, a particular kind of song structurally too that had a lot of African-American influence, really cyclical, really driving, a particular kind of modality, um, beautiful flat seven kind of implications to some of the melodies uh if you want the musical take on that but beautiful beautiful uh melodies about these folks and stories and uh uh yeah that was such a great experience to create that piece and um and then play it with you all a lot since we moved to albany uh six years ago we've i don't know how many times we played that but quite a bit and um so that was our bridge to thinking about doing something again. So it's it's so exciting to to have the banjo keep you know keep doing its thing in the chamber music context. So I can't I cannot wait to start rehearsing to see see how this is all going to materialize. Yes. We um from New Music USA we got uh, a small grant to do some workshop rehearsals uh, last was it no wait not th not this August last August. How, was it already a year and something ago? I believe it was a year. Oh, yeah, the creator, yeah. the creator fund, right? Yeah. Time is so wild, but that's yes. like such a gift. I, yes. you know, sometimes things feel so rushed. Uh, I don't know about you all, but in some classical circles that I've worked in, like there's people are, it's a luxury. It's a luxury to have that kind of workshopping time together, mm -hmm. you know, to think, to talk to say, hey, can you try this crazy thing on the clarinet? What happens? Can you flip the note up like this? And uh, so this piece is is also built on some of that really nice time we had together thinking and watching and learning from you all um, what banjo-esque things could kind of find their way into your fingers. <laughs> Do you want to talk more about how you navigated between the classical world and folk music world? and creating chamber folk as you as we've talked yeah. about that kind of genre or kind of blending of the two it's wild because you know to me and thinking as a musicologist someone who's always thinking about culture and practice as we create the sounds you know i'm thinking about the how we do it and what we think as we do it and what values we're shooting for as we do it um you know, I, I love about old time music, the immediacy of it, the fact that um, you can sit down with strangers and if you have some tunes in common, you know, you can you can just uh, get into that cycle of the tune. And uh, there's a the big communal part of it. And again, not to say that classical music doesn't have that, but the the old time jam is can go all night sometimes you know it's this it's this being in the place letting the music emerge um and i always and not not a lot of pre-planning do you know what i'm saying you know you have the tunes in your head and and you make them work as you go in the moment with the people that you either know really well or that you just met at a festival so i one thing that i've always trying to that i've always been trying to push for as the banjo comes into chamber music context is how how can that immediacy emerge, you know? And that's not foreign to classical music. You know, there's aleatoric traditions, you know, where composers give indications of, you're not gonna know ahead of time what this is gonna sound like. So kind of thinking about composers who have done that, how can I do that in a way that stays connected to the tune? Um, how can I give musicians enough information that they'll feel good kind of doing what you do in an old time jam, which is like, I know the tune, and so that I can riff on it in this way and that, and I can feel free to, this is what's written on the page, but I, I know that Emily's not expecting me to play it 
with exact timing. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, like you'll see in the score, I literally write at points, I'm like, messy. You know what I mean? Please, like, you know, don't overthink the timing of this one. Like, it's supposed to sound all just together, but not together at the same time, you know? Um, and so in rounder songs, there are moments where I, I specifically wrote out that kind of fuzzy timing, you know, like literally timed it and wrote it precisely to do that. And there's times that I hope as we rehearse this piece that like, I'm going to encourage you guys to explore <laughs> the edges of that fuzzy timing that although it's notated, I'm going to say, or like it might say over a part, like, okay, you, you are singing out here. It's your lead thing. You can be late. You can drag this. You can rush it a little bit. You can like, let your melody sit in with everybody else as you want, or like, you, like the bass sometimes I'll tell you bass and guitar you guys are timekeepers right now so you have to lay it down you really do have to like be on the on the downbeat but other folks let it let it drift like your drift might be this way or that way so I think our rehearsal process will have some of that in it which is um what I hope we'll inject it with like that beauty of being in an old time jam where it's like I will be singing my song and I'll be like oh hear how Laura did that this time oh that was really cool oh man oh she always oh, hitting that a little bit more on the like the end of the 16th I don't know you know what I mean that like you'll be just adding your flavors as that piece starts living inside you so that's that's my hope for it you know and while I've notated most stuff out there are a couple points especially I'm trying to think if it's in the first movement or the last movement where I might even encourage you we'll see we'll see how we feel when we're all together to be like okay i know i notated this out but you've already played this you know earlier in the piece so this time around like if you want to add this kind of thing or if you want to just repeat that note a few times instead of one time you know so that hopefully like we kind of lay it down with that flexibility but then when it all comes back later on that you can kind of feel like let's really listen to each other and you know hey laura might uh, be saying something a little different on the flute this time around. So, and then on Eric will be, okay, like I can lock into that in this way, which is, you know, it's a variation on what is the piece. I'm not asking you to invent whole cloth, but that's my big hope. <laughs> I, I can't speak for other folks in five by five, maybe folks want to jump in, but as classically trained musicians, you know, this like gives us the heebie-jeebies in a major way because <laughs> like it's you know it's it's not it's not easy for us to yeah. let go and we've had um you know and we try to do some uh p improvisational pieces and we also collaborated with um some jazz musicians and we had some interesting conversations about process and like how to understand and interpret things yeah, yeah. but i don't know if any other five by five folks want to jump in on that those experiences that we've had and how that, you know, it's really important for us to do that, these kind of experiences, but they're, they're scary. Oh they my God. Yeah. Scary. yeah. So scary. Yeah. I know. I get it. I would love to hear from all of you. <laughs> Ken is smiling. Ken, what are you smiling about? <laughs> no, I thought uh, I play a fair amount of folk music. I wonder how that would be actually. I. I look forward to it. I'm not too scared. It seems good, fun. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking forward to, um, cause I tend to play a lot with Laura just because we're both the woodwind players. And so our lines tend to be linked one way or another. And, um, it seems like there's been times in other applications actually when we're, trying to be a little bit off from one another that mm. it's just so easy to link up accidentally when you're Absolutely. trying not to. Yes. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges for us, but I think um, we're getting more comfortable doing it because our group has experimented. So, although yeah. it's been a while though, we've spent the last couple of years being really precise about everything. <laughs> this is our chance to break out again. There you go. Eric, I know you've been thinking a lot about fiddle lately. Like, I know you've been playing with your bow and doing all kinds of cool stuff. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm super excited f about it. I can't wait. Um, you know, I grew up listening to bluegrass music. My grandparents used to take me to concerts all the time. And so it feels like I'm going back home every time I hear it. And and I listen to it just in my normal, like, day-to-day -day routine. So, um, and I don't know, I like playing stuff where we don't all have to be together but we have to like listen and work with in mm -hmm. that creativity i find that very um 
very inspiring and like it, it gets everything like kind of bubbling. Yeah, beautiful. Hey, Yun, I don't know if you were going to say anything, but I want to say that you are you are a percussive machine in this piece. I, I like I that. Hope, I hope you have fun. You are going to be laying it down a lot of the time. You are you are like the fifth string on the banjo. Like you're all these punchy syncopated inside moments mm -hmm. like are really <clears throat> they're coming out in your part. So I hope I hope you have so much fun. Like you're you're going to be an anchor for a lot of us. And you're also going to be like the, the, the rhythmic excitement too, you know, and oh, Eric I... and Ken, you're locking in with that an awful lot as well. But like your part is really like, yeah, I love the, um, that my part is mimicking banjos, um, up and down mm -hmm. and with the different rhythm, like single patient and then downbeat. Yes. And you are the banjo is playing the melody, and it's kind of lacking. Um, yes. So I'm I'm yeah really excited too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How it's gonna sound? Yeah, me too. Me too. I had a lot of fun with your part because I don't know about you all, but like as someone who's like I I sang classically, I have a degree in voice singing class, so it's not like classical is foreign to me. It's not like that, but it's um, it's uh. when I sit with a piece, do you know what I mean? When I'm writing a song is one thing. I feel very comfortable. I know where I want it to go. I know what aesthetic I'm shooting for. I know the artists I like. I know the people who I think I will hope will listen to it. But when I go to write a classical piece, there's a lot of worry on my end too of like, I'm like, oh, if I don't make this complicated enough, people are going to be upset with me. I, and I know like I try to tell myself, just get that out of there. That's like old school. That's no one's thinking like that anymore but it I can't help it like sometimes that just comes into my head so I'm just like oh man you better you better rework this you better put like five million like you know fancy runs and I that feels silly to say that but it's like we have those little stories that kind of repeat in our head that mm -hmm. and I really I tried to resist that you know what I mean because part of what I part of what is intricate and difficult about this piece is the interlock do you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's not so much that it's technically demanding or that I'm pushing the limits of the instruments. It's, it's more the complexity is in how we build the texture together, you know? So mm -hmm. I said, I just said, Emily, ease up, man, ease up, man. Each individual part doesn't have to be pushing the individual musician to their, mm -hmm. you know, uh, creative or technical limit because we're going to have that challenge of the, creating creating the texture together in this interlocking driving mm -hmm. and at also times really really lyrical way yeah there's different kinds of technique there's different mm -hmm. kind there's things that we'll learn from you and and in playing this that i think we wouldn't learn otherwise right yeah 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 Anything, any questions from anybody? Any comments? I have a question. Yeah. I have a couple of questions that relate to each other. Uh, so I was just trying to look up what broadside stories are. Mm -hmm. and I found one that seems to be murder related. Yes. And there's a portrait of, I think that's the killer. Ooh. I wonder, are we are for our audiences are we gonna see that things i hope so stories that inspired the music yes because um you know rounder songs like i worked with a painter and we projected all her images and it was very immersive and like it brings this one murder ballad to life but um all the broadside ballads most of the time there's plenty that are just text you know and letterpress but a lot of them would have like woodblock prints at the top with characters or um Sometimes printers would just have a woodblock print that didn't necessarily match the story. They'd slam it on there anyway, just to have a beautiful visual. But like, I just went to this woodblock print workshop the other day, but I'm hoping that we'll uh, also have some imagery projecting around. It might not be as narrative as Rounder Song was, a little more like kind of textures dancing around. But that is definitely, that is what I'm working on right now is figuring out how 
that's all gonna come together whether it's gonna be new stuff inspired in the old print style or if I'm gonna kind of snapshot some um, some old broadside ballads themselves and kind of have those fragments of the, that old imagery from the 17th or well mostly from the 18th and 19th century kind of weave in and out as we perform so yeah thanks for bringing that up that is very much on my mind Mm, yeah so so the original source that you got is from the new york public library the new york um the new york state public library has a collection of broadside ballads and i started there because they have um a huge amount of henry bacchus's poetry that bard of socrates who was married to um Ann Eliza. Mm -hmm. so i started there you know reading through their collection and they have some very very old stuff or at least duplicates of some very old things and then some much more recent ones 19th century broadside ballad printing went even into the early 20th even though it was nowhere near as popular at that point um yeah and so the printing styles imagine you know like from 1600s in Europe to early 20th century in the US, the printing styles are all very different. But um, we're going to do some workshops with uh, Flower City Arts in Rochester. And they're going to walk people who are in those workshops through the the machinery that was used to set and print the poetry. So that would be so cool to see. Cool. So so the stories you write, you wrote music on, they're just text. There's no the text, I created original text. I, I didn't find any set okay. broadside ballad yeah. that, that was right, you know? So so I wrote using some structures of broadside ballad, but again, it breaks apart at times too. Like I said, I'll, I'll deliver a verse or I'll do something in kind of tight poetic meter and then we'll float out of that as, as another story is in counterpoint with that. Or again, like as we hear about the court case in a tight rhyming verse, like the way you would in a broadside ballad, and then we float out of that and we hear Anna Dorothea talking herself. Right. Uh, so it's it's kind of in and out. It's not, mm. even, though, even though I thought this would be cool to really do a ballad, right? And just tell the story from start to finish. It just, it didn't, that didn't happen. I felt too stuck in it. I wanted, I felt like there was so much more to say that I, that I, I needed to break out of it. So in and out of poetic form. Mm. No, this sounds cool. Thank you. Thank you. And Emily mentioned the workshops that we'll be doing at Flower City Arts Center here in Rochester. And those will happen the week before our concerts in Syracuse and Rochester. And on March 21st from six to nine, uh, it's called a, a Taste of Letter Press. Learn about 19th century printing techniques while enjoying light refreshments and exploring the letterpress collection at Flower City Arts Center. And they've been fantastic to work together and kind of um, create these opportunities and these experiences as part of Enduring Stories, This, the concert that we'll be um, doing in the spring. And then the day after is a shorter kind of 10 minute drop in like that Friday one is very much like you can create your own thing. And that's why it's a little bit more at $60. And then the one the next day is a 10 minute drop in where you can create a preset commemorative broadsheet on a 19th century press. And so all this, uh, we'll, hopefully we'll get some video, we'll stop by there and get some video. And so people can see kind of what they can create. But the, those two workshops are happening the week before the concerts on the 29th and 30th, the 29th in Syracuse at May, at May Memorial Unitarian at seven o'clock. And then in Rochester, the day after Sunday, March 30th at Rochester Academy of Medicine, actually we're returning home, Emily, right? That's yeah. where we performed Rounder Songs with Emily back in a ways back, I think that was 2019, 18, something 19? like that. Maybe yes. it was 19. Yeah, 19. I, I think you're right. I think it may have been 19 because I remember live from Hoxton when we performed Rounder Songs. Uh, I think that was 2019. And um, and then we'll actually also be returning to live from Hoxton and we'll be playing um, some of Rounder and some of Ephemera. We will have to finalize that program. That's Wednesday, April 2nd. Uh, live from Hochstein on WXXI 91.5 FM. And uh, so we're really looking forward to revisiting rounder songs and then jumping in and getting started with uh, ephemera ballads. 
Is there any other, are there any other questions or comments? Emily, do you want to play something else to take us on out? I will, I could sing you a couple verses from around your song before we go. All right. tunes out again <laughs> thank you so much everybody for being here chris thank it's you. beautiful to see you thank, thank you emily it was Jack. really nice oh um, yeah my love to keep everyone in Pittsburgh. Work. thank you yeah. you too you keep okay. that mandolin bye 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 well thank you everybody for being here and we look forward to sharing all this fantastic music in the spring and getting started with ephemera ballads um, and revisiting rounder songs. It was so nice hearing that tune that you just did because we, right? we just had such a fantastic time playing together with you on it. So looking forward to revisiting that music. Me any other too. last, yeah. Any other last thoughts or, or comments or anything? Thanks everybody for being here. And we'll Enjoy see everybody Thanksgiving. soon. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> care, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.